For the last 27 years, I've been puzzling over the question of how learning mathematics can become relevant to students' lives, connected to things that they care about and significant for the world that we live in. I don't think there's a single way this can be done, but I want to share with you today some of what I've concluded so far in thinking about those questions. The questions became relevant for me 27 years ago as a newly qualified teacher. As I walked into a school in South London, my first job in, in England, a comprehensive school in South London as a teacher of mathematics. I was newly qualified, armed with a degree in maths and philosophy from Oxford, teacher training from Cambridge, I had ideals for my classroom, wanted my students to be creative, independent in their work in mathematics. I imagined them asking questions about the subject, finding out about themselves, thinking about what place they could take up in the world and things that they would be able to do with mathematics and other things that they were learning. I imagined teaching as a driver of social change towards a fairer, more equitable, more sustainable society. Perhaps inevitably, the reality turned out a little different. In that first year of teaching, I recognize I put off a lot of students from mathematics. Students who might have started with enthusiasm ended up with far less at the end of the year. I wanted my students to be autonomous, but hadn't perhaps factored in that that autonomy might be expressed by ignoring me. My own journey towards becoming a teacher has been very influenced by engaging in the writings and ideas of an educator born in Africa called Caleb Gatenyo, who actually would have been 110 a week ago today if he was still alive. I want to play you a 45 second clip of him talking towards the end of his life. I hope the sound is gonna work. It is often repeated that I teach them but they don't learn. Well, if you know that, Stop teaching. <laughs> Not resign from your job. Stop teaching in the way that doesn't read, reach the people to learn. And try to understand what there is to do for you to be every day more skilled in helping these youngsters uh, furnish their minds with things which are so elementary that when they take five years today, I can do them, them in 18 months, less sometimes. Stop teaching in a way that doesn't reach people to learn. Well, I certainly needed to do something different after my first year of teaching. And it was through collaborations, particularly with Lorinda Brown and others, that I began over some years to get a sense of how I could be in a classroom so that my classroom began to approximate some of my ideals. Here's an image of a couple of pages of some students' work from 1998, four or so years into my teaching. I placed emphasis on students asking questions, writing down their ideas about their mathematics. I'd helped design a curriculum in this school where students would work on quite extended tasks over a period of time. A typical homework might be to work on your own question for half an hour, and the next lesson would be a sharing of what students had discovered and, and found out, and we'd move on from there. I wasn't teaching five years and 18 months, I'm still working on that one, but most students were pretty engaged. And I now teach at a university trying to support other people, other teachers, in realizing their dreams for their classroom. But Gatenio's ideas, Gatenio's practice, shows us just what could be possible in schools. And what we need to understand for us to be every day more skilled. Because that's really what I want to talk about today. In research that I've done with Professor Natalie Sinclair, who works in Canada, we've come to the view that there are a set of beliefs that get in the way of us becoming more skilled every day a set of beliefs about learning that blind us to some of the learning and ways that learning happens all around us. And I want to talk about just one of those beliefs today. It's a belief that I think can inhibit people reaching their potential in whole areas of life, a belief that's become a dogma because it's unquestioned. And it seems quite innocuous, really. It's the belief that learning is some kind of vertical construction and particularly in learning maths, that we learn it in some building block kind of way, 
that we need solid foundations. You need to really understand the basics before you go on to understand anything else. And because this idea seems so natural, it also seems natural to us that in schools we often separate children, depending on where they are in this vertical construction, and teach them in different classes, teach them different things, and only let one group of students have access to the more interesting levels of mathematics. It's because this idea seems so natural that it seems obvious to us that if a student hasn't understood step nine, we can't possibly teach them step 10 or 11 or 12. And what that then means is that when you get to secondary school, if you're underachieving in mathematics relative to your peers, you're likely to be offered an essentially circular curriculum where you keep revisiting this site of failure, this step that you don't understand. You're never given access to what might be going on uh, in other places of the curriculum. So I want to try and unpick this idea today. Because I think we know if we look around us that learning is often not like that. I think looking around, many of you might have experienced a young child taking their first steps. If you haven't, there are some wonderful trick uh, clips on YouTube where you see this happening. And a common feature of many of these clips is that the child stutters a bit, begins to fall, and then runs a couple of steps, usually caught then by an adult. So if we think about that, what it means is that children, and including you, we ran before we walked. And it even goes so far as to say we learned to walk by running. To take an example from history, the astronomer Caroline Herschel, born in 1750, discoverer of comets and cataloger of stars, famously never knew her time's tables. And yet it seems the edifice of her mathematics wasn't irreparably damaged by this shaky foundation. School-age children, going into a school where they don't know the language, achieve a functional fluency in three months. Now that's not by somebody deciding which bits of the language they've got to learn first and which bits not, deciding what's simple and what's complex and mapping out some journey of their learning. It's through being immersed in this complex whole, this complex situation. And being allowed to use what Caleb Gatenya would call the powers of their mind. Gatenya believed that if you've learned one language, then you must have had the powers to spot patterns, to make predictions, to decide how to focus in a situation, to be able to focus on one aspect and not another in a complex situation. So what I want to think about in the second half of what I'm going to offer today is what this might mean for teaching. How might we teach in a way that respects this idea of the powers of children's minds? And the image of learning that I want to offer is one much more connected to the theme of this day of interconnections. Because it seems to me in that image of learning a language, in that immersion kind of way, what you're learning is not a vertical construction. It's much more you learn little knots of effective practice, little knots of relevance, and you start piecing them together, creating more of a mesh or a network than a vertical construction. And it's this image I want to think about. What, how might we teach if we're interested in learning as a sort of mesh work, not a construction? Well, I want to offer two concepts in the, in the, in the maths curriculum that are often difficult for people. And the first one is negative numbers. Of course, there's a lot of difficulty for people. So this, this chart here is one you'll see in many uh, primary schools in England. And it's a very useful one. We can use it for adding, adding up numbers in ones, adding up in tens, and so on. But if you begin, and this is all you see about number, uh, and if number is linked to concrete objects w w when you begin, it seems quite difficult to think about what a negative number might be. This chart seems somehow complete. It's not quite clear, really, where you go from here. Very simple addition, for me, transforms what we're seeing there. Adding these extra layers in, there are questions that immediately arise, like what would happen if we keep on going to the left or keep on going to the right? Infinities are suddenly there. And I can guarantee you that if this chart was in classrooms in England, then even if you only ever focused on the white squares, at some point a child's going to say to you, what are those numbers at the top with a little dash next to them? And it seems to me, as soon as a child asks you a question, my job's half done as a teacher. It's through looking at a more complex situation that the idea of negatives 
fits into some kind of pattern. It allows us as learners to make use of that power of our mind to spot patterns. Or to take another example of algebra. Again, a stumbling block in many people's learning of mathematics. And typically at the beginning of algebra, you might be asked to think about what's A plus A, another way of writing that, what does A plus B mean? And it all seems extraordinary, really, arbitrary. What on earth is going on here? And if students struggle with this kind of mathematics, then again, we might often think, well, maybe they need something simpler. Maybe they need something concrete. And if, as a learner, you keep struggling with this kind of mathematics, maybe, actually, it's decided that you've reached your mathematical ceiling. Maybe I'm no longer going to try and teach you this stuff. Maybe you're just, just not up to it. You're not capable of it. And I want to suggest that none of that is the case. That rather than needing something more simple, what might be needed is something more complex. Later on in the learning of algebra, you might come across the idea of algebra in the context of a function. So here we go. I'm going to do this now and imagine, well, we'll try to do this in a bit of silence. You've got to try and figure out what's going on here. Okay, anyone figured it out? So I put that number there. Well, if we were in a classroom, I'd want someone to come up silently to write it, but I can't really do that. Anyone want to shout out what number they think might come there? Okay, if you said nine, you'd be right. And again, if we were in my classroom, I'd ask you to give me the next number. Was that six you said? Yeah, great. Okay, anybody want to say what they think this one is? Okay, and one more. Let's see if you can see what's going on here. Five. Okay, so what's happening here? So even if you've never done any algebra, I reckon I could put that one up, and we might be able to think about, well, what's the rule you're using here? How are you getting that? And if you haven't uh, seen what the pattern was, then maybe this will help you. So all that algebra is saying there is I take in my number, maybe you were adding it to itself and adding one, or maybe you were doubling it and adding one. In this more complex way of thinking about algebra, algebra as functions, it begins to make a bit more sense. There's some pattern to observe and to notice. This A plus A and whatever that was about suddenly becomes a bit more obvious. Well, yes, N plus N is just 2N. If I add a number to itself, that is going to be the same as doubling it. OK, I want to offer you one more story. Some years ago, I was supporting the master's dissertation of a teacher, teaching in Bristol. And she was working with a low attaining group of 15 and 16-year-olds. They were coming up to their school leaving exam at 16. And she decided she wanted to work with them on some ideas that were two or three years ahead of the curriculum in terms of any kind of sequential sequence of learning. And there was one particular girl in this class who had extremely low levels of numeracy. And this teacher decided that she would work with them on Pythagoras' theorem, which some of you may remember was all about squares and square rootings and triangles. So this teacher worked with this class on Pythagoras' theorem for a couple of weeks. About a month or so later, the teacher asked a question, the square root of 49. This girl put up her hand and answered it, told her, seven. The teacher nearly fell off her chair because that was the first question this girl had ever answered in her lessons. This girl had likely been taught about square roots for the last seven years in her maths teaching. And probably what would have happened is a teacher would have diagnosed that she didn't know about square roots, would have focused on it, tried to fill in this gap in her foundation of learning mathematics, and it didn't work for seven years. Two weeks working on something more complex, and a month later she'd retained what square roots were. It was by looking at this more complex situation that square roots had a need, had a purpose, and became meaningful for her, something that she could then retain. So what does this all mean? Well, what I want to suggest is that if you're a teacher and you're teaching someone who's found something difficult, then rather than thinking that they need something more simple, it might be that they need something more complex. And I guess that applies to you as a parent as well. If you're a learner who struggled in mathematics, please don't think that there's any intellectual failing on your part. Most likely, you were never offered an image of a complex whole that the maths you were learning in could fit into. You were never offered an opportunity to use the powers of your mind to spot patterns, make predictions about what was going on. And for all of you, next time you think about learning as some kind of process of vertical construction, I hope that the image of a meshwork, a network of messy knots of relevance, 
will also come to mind. Thank you.